Take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 tonight and uh, put your marker here if you will as we continue in our study of the book of Nehemiah. As you're turning to Nehemiah tonight, um, you stop and you think about the nation of Israel as we get to Nehemiah 9, and they have come a very, very long way in this journey, uh, not just mileage-wise, but I mean spiritually. They've come a long way. Remember that as we started out in the book of Nehemiah, the children of Israel, this remnant that came with Nehemiah, they have traveled 800 miles from Babylon to get to Jerusalem. When they get to Jerusalem, the conditions are not good. Uh, you would say, well, okay, if we're going to be rebuilding the walls, it'd be really nice to see, you know, the big box trucks for Menards backed up and the flatbed trucks and, and all this stuff ready to go. And that's not what they see. When they come, they see a pile of rubble. They see the decay and, and the dismay that all of Jerusalem is in. And yet, uh, these people in the midst of storms of opposition, they came from the enemy, from naysayers, and even from people within they still accomplished the task that was before them. And that is because uh, the Lord had gave them a heart to work. They had given their hearts to the work, but God had given them a good leader. And that leader was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah knew exactly what was necessary to do to get this job accomplished. When we got into Nehemiah chapter 8, we said that was the transition chapter. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, we go from working to worshiping. And we see the difference that begins to take place with the children of Israel uh, tonight, we look at Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9 has been called the longest prayer in the Bible. Now, it all depends on how you gauge a prayer. Some have said Psalm 119 is the longest prayer. Well, I can see how you can get that depending on how you read it. Maybe you can read it and say, hey, that does sound like David is, is praying. Um, but a true prayer, you know, some have said John 17, Jesus' prayer. But then we have this one here. So, uh, maybe in the Old Testament, this will put this one on the, uh, the platform, the, the higher uh, side, and say this is the biggest prayer. We're not going to get all through it tonight. I know that doesn't surprise any of you, but we're not going to make it. But as we look at this tonight, let's add some context of the chapter and things that we saw last week in preparation for what we'll see this week. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani, and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Yeshua, and Cadmiel, and Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shabaniah, and Pethathiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host the earth and all the things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. As we break this prayer down, I'm going to go ahead and give you all four points that we will eventually look at. First of all, we're going to deal with the radiance of God. That's going to take us a little bit to get through that. That is verses 5 through 15. And it is where the, the, the prayer focuses on the majesty, the glory, the radiance of God. And it's very, very important that this prayer focuses on this, and we'll talk about that tonight. We'll look at the rebellion of the people, then the righteousness of God, then the repentance of the people. So tonight as we begin, the radiance of God. From 1919 until 1963, there was a man who had never, ever received a formal education. He was saved at the age of 17. At the age of 22, he was called upon to pastor the first church that he would pastor. And he was a pastor within the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination. And that fellow was A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer wrote uh, some amazing things. And one of the things that Tozer wrote, and it's amazing when you consider the time period in which he wrote, he looked at the, the degradation that was happening in the church then, and he was brokenhearted over it. 
And he was calling the church then to repentance, calling the church then to get out of the worldliness and to realize that they are called to be a separated entity unto God. In a book that I have of many of his quotes, I want you to listen to what he writes in regards to worship. He said, worship and entertainment are not synonymous, yet many in our evangelical churches today think that they are. Sunday morning to some has become a time of religious musical entertainment, thinking that it is pleasing unto God. The carnal Christian cannot worship without religious rattles and toys. Otherwise, he gets bored and loses interest. Unless we get to know what God is like, unless we know God, we will accept all of the superficial nonsense that passes for Christianity today. Our perception of God determines our perception of worship. With the loss of the concept of the majesty of God comes the loss of the art of worship. We no longer worship. I'm not sure what we do. But it does not contain the reverence and the awesome wonder about God that our forefathers cherished. Worship is to feel in the heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe. If we would desire to enter into genuine, sincere worship as a Christian, we have got to know who God is. And I will guarantee you that the more that we focus our attention, and this is why it is so vitally important, Christians, that as we look at this passage of Scripture here, we are called to get to know God. This is written to believers. This isn't written to the lost. The lost cannot worship the Lord. Those that worship Him in the Gospel of John, it says, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You must be born again, and it must be in accordance to the truth of the Word of God. When you get to this passage here, this is talking to believers because we're the only ones that can really get to know who God is. But here's something that is mind-boggling. The closer it seems that you get to understanding who God is, the more you realize how very little you know. And it seems like, oh, I'm, I'm starting to get a grasp on it. It's like, it, you know, the, the kids, when I was, you know, it hasn't not that old, not that long ago, they would talk about something, man, that just blows your mind. The closer that you get as a Christian to figuring out God, the more it blows your mind, and you realize, I haven't figured out anything at all. And it drops us in awe and wonder and worship. The radiance of God. That's why this is so important. And as we look at this, there, tonight we're only going to be able to hit two points. We start out looking at the radiance of God. Jeremiah, or <laughs> Jeremiah, Nehemiah acknowledges first of all that he is the God of creation. He is the God of creation. In verses 5 and 6 again, the last part as he tells them to stand up Stand forever and ever, or blessed, okay, let me get started here. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed, and here's where the transition happens. This goes into a prayer now. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all things that are there in the seas, and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. The host of heaven bows down and worships God. Who's the host of heaven that's doing this? When you read throughout the Old Testament, there's two references that are made as to who the host of heaven are. The first, the Bible talks about the stars, the planets, the, everything that's out there in the universe, and calls that the host of heaven. But then the Bible also talks in the Old Testament about the angels being the host. You say, well, which one's being talked about here? Let's be politically correct. I think both. And I, I, not to be politically correct, I really believe both are in view here because both are in view in other places of Scripture. Go with me to the book of Job, chapter 38. Job chapter 38, and look with me at the first seven verses. 
In Job 38, in the first seven verses, remember Job's done, done a lot of talking in this book. <laughs> Those three friends have done a lot of talking in this book. The fourth friend comes in and tries to offset some of the things that those three friends had said. And finally, God says, enough's enough, I'm talking. And when he starts talking, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Doesn't that sound like a very strict father when he says, that's it. Time for you to sit down. You listen to me. Did your dad ever talk to you like that? <laughs> Mine did. And you know what you knew at that point? You better shut up. It is time to listen. And I, I just get that picture. Gird up your loins like a man. I will demand of thee, and you better answer me. Here's the question. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the lines upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The angels at the creation of this world. Imagine that scene as they sang together and shouted to God for joy. What an absolute amazing picture to get. Let's go to Psalm 148. Psalm 148, let's notice what David says here. And it's interesting, when you get into the last of the Psalms, David is going to say this a lot. Psalm 148, praise ye the Lord. You know, we got that song we sing, praise ye the Lord. Very good. So that's what he says. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. Notice what's being referred to here. The universal creations, the constellations, the planets, the stars, the moon, the sun. Praise him. How in the world? You know, doesn't that boggle your mind that God tells those things that he made to praise him? And you're thinking, how do they do that? But yet he tells them to do it. The praise comes to God the creator for these things. During the French Revolution, there was many people who wanted to get rid of Christianity, and they did everything in their power to eradicate it. There was one rather um, boastful atheist, and it was a clear, clear, beautiful night, and he was outspoken about his beliefs that Christianity could be eradicated, and he finds this uh, peasant, and the peasant I mean, had absolutely nothing except for one thing, he had faith in his Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And to that peasant, this atheist said, everything will be abolished. Churches, Bibles, the clergy. Yes, even the Word of God itself. We shall remove everything that speaks of religion. And that peasant kind of chuckled. That made the atheist mad. The atheist says, what are you laughing about? The peasant says, well, and he looks up. He says, how are you going to turn those lights out? You get it? How are you going to turn the stars off? How are you going to shut the light off? You want to eradicate God? You can try to, but it's never going to happen because the sky will not be silent. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament declareth His wonder. In Romans chapter 1, we know that creation is not something that is supposed to be worshipped, but rather creation ought to bring us to a point that we would want to worship our God. In Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, and we know some of the things that are talked about in Romans chapter 1, but zeroing in on this specifically, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, 
to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We live in a world today where creation is worshiped. Saving the planet, saving the ozone, our carbon footprint, all this nonsense that you hear repeatedly. We live in a world that worships the creation, but not the creator. And Christians, you and I, we know that we're not supposed to worship creation. We know that we are supposed to worship the creator. And you say, yeah, but how does all this tie in? Think about everything that we have seen here. God created absolutely everything. He created the laws of nature. There is no such thing. I've said this before. Every time I hear somebody say Mother Nature, I just want to slap them. I just, everything comes over me in anger. There is no such thing. God is the one who created this world. God created the laws that govern the planet. He created the beauty. He created the colors. He created the intricacy of design and symmetry. He created the seasons and the things that go along with it. Yes, even snow. He created the plants. I knew a couple of you were, would say amen to that. He created the plants. He created the animals. He created the birds. He created the sea life. He created within the species similarities and yet enough difference that you can tell the difference between the various animals within their species. He created man from the dust of the earth. And the Bible says that he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. He created the woman from one of Adam's ribs after Adam was put to sleep by God and a, and a heavenly surgery takes place. He created them both knowing that it wouldn't be long after creation before they would introduce, and ultimately Adam, because it is through one man, Adam, that sin entered into the human race. But he still created them anyway, knowing exactly what they were going to do. And then this man, this man that has messed it up, God entrusts with everything that he had created. You know, the more I thought about this and how creation draws us to worship God, uh, the more that something really got stuck in my crawl that upset me. We know that evolution is wrong. We know that it is not biblical. But as I got into studying this, um, I, I just be honest with you, I can feel my blood pressure rising and my temper getting hot. Because the more that you understand how God has said that it is he is the God of creation, and recognizing the God of creation and what the God of creation has done should draw us to worship Him. You have got these, these nitwits out there. It's not just wrong to teach evolution, whether it be uh, humanistic or theistic evolution. It's not just wrong. It is insulting and it is blasphemous to the God who created this world. And those individuals who will believe that stuff, they are willfully ignorant of the simplicity of the Bible. They're not just deluded. They're not confused. They are willfully being ignorant to the simplicity. They are allowing a pseudoscience to steer them away from what the Bible says. Look back again at Psalm 148 and verse 5. This is where, and I, I, it's one of those things you know, but you see it kind of in a different light and it smacks you. In Psalm 148 and verse 5, the Bible says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. Now, I don't hear eons of time in that, do you? He commanded, they were created. Very simple. Let's go to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. 
As you read those verses, do you hear eons of time in that? You know how you get eons of time in there? You have to invent it and you have to imagine it. It isn't there. And in fact, if eons of time was there, it says he spake it and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Okay, when God spake something into existence, commanded it, and it stood fast, did it gravitate towards standing fast or did it stand fast? If you've ever poured concrete, you know that when you have poured your concrete, your concrete does not stand fast. It has to become fast. It takes time. And it's, we wait for it to set up, right? That's not in the Bible when it comes to creation. God didn't create a planet like it was concrete and he poured it out dribbles at a time and it had to eventually set up and become what it is today. That is moronic thinking. It goes contrary to what the Word of God blatantly, clearly says. God did it. He spake it. It was done. He commanded. It stood fast. How much clearer could it be? Go to Genesis chapter 1. You know, anybody with the most elementary, rudimentary understanding of the English language can understand what this is saying. You're not going to hear passages of time. Oh, but the science, the science. You know, I am really sick and tired of hearing people say, trust the science. Now, now honestly, folks, listen. We have been deluded by stupidity. We are supposed to trust the science. The same scientist that told us we evolved from a chimp or a blob and the same scientists that teach evolution, and I'm supposed to keep trusting the science, keep trusting the science. Really? I don't trust the science. I don't trust the average scientist that opens their mouth. Because the average scientist that opens up their mouth is going to sometimes speak contrary to this book. Genesis 1-3, God said, Let there be light, and light became right? It evolved. Is that what it says? Let there be light, or, or yeah, let there be light, finish it out. There was light. Go to verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Verse 9. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. Finish it out. And it was so. Verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielded, yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Finish it out. Verse 15, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And God said, and it was so. There is no evolution in that. You have got to invent something if you're going to go contrary to what the blatant, obvious word of God teaches. And to teach something contrary to the Word of God. Here's the whole thing, folks. If you don't believe this part of the Bible, you ain't going to believe this part of the Bible. Oh, that's not true. I do too. If you're going to question this, and that ain't that many pages, you're going to question this somewhere along the line. I just, I'm in the process of reading a book by Ken Ham. And he says... Actually, Genesis 1 through Genesis 11 lays out the beginnings, the fundamentals of everything that you will see the rest of Scripture built upon. And so when you start questioning these, these rudimentary, fundamental books of the Bible, you will question the other stuff. And if you cannot trust simply that God said, let there be, and it was, then you tell me how in the world are you going to believe that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that whosoever means just that, 
whosoever. And that God's plan of salvation was not something that was just for a a few people that he decided that he'll save, but the rest, eh, you're going to hell. I ain't going to save you. The plan of salvation really wasn't for you. It was only for certain ones. If you cannot believe what the Bible says in one spot, you will question it in another, and you will create other false doctrines. It is so fundamental, Christian, that you and I have an understanding of what the first book of the Bible teaches, and we stand upon it. And somebody says, yeah, but what about carbon dating? What about this? What about that? I will admit to you, there's a lot of stuff I don't understand when it comes to that stuff. And I listen to these people go off on their tangents of explaining stuff, and even the ones that can explain it from a Christian perspective, and they have a good legitimate understanding of Scripture and everything else, that I still get lost with them. Some of the stuff on Answers in Genesis' website, when it gets super technical, I'm super gone. I'm just, you just, you went over my head, I'm done. All right? It's not that I disbelieve, it's just like, I, I don't care. I don't care. I don't need all the, the nitty gritties. I'm not a scientist. I'm not in a laboratory. I'm not playing with test tubes and chemicals and all that. I don't care. I just know what the Bible says. Now, if you're sitting here and go, oh, I, but I really get into that. That is awesome. What great proof and evidence, yada, 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 of what the Bible says. Great. Read it for me. And if you can re- explain it to me in simplified terms, awesome. But if I start to glaze over and you see the glazed over look, just quit. You lost me. All right. Um, I'm a simple individual, and I'm simple enough to believe what the Bible says. God said it, it was so, done. I don't need to explain it any farther than that. But the whole point of creation, man, when you think about what God did in creating this world, I'm not impressed in the least little bit with an evolutionary God. I don't know how anybody could be. But boy, I sure am impressed. And I am shocked and I am humbled by a God who said, let there be, and it was. And who created all things out of nothing. That just leaves me speechless. I don't know what to say. You know, these are simple truths that we've known and believed, but... One of the hymn writers just laid it out perfect. O Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. He is the God of creation. The radiance of God seen in creation. (laughs) We don't need music for that. Don't need to take up an offering for that. Really don't even need preaching for that. We just need God's word and a walk outside. And it's like, wow. And then to think that God made us. That ought to humble every one of us. Which brings us to the second point that we'll deal with tonight. He is the God of transformation. He is the God of transformation. Not only the God of creation, but the God of transformation. Back to Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. It says, Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. The God of transformation. God chose Abram. It is not for salvation. Read the scripture. What did he choose him for? He chose him for a service. He chose him for a purpose, to accomplish something, to father the nation of Israel through this one guy, 
the progenitor of the, the Jewish people. He was chosen to do something special for God. Have you ever thought tonight, Christian, what an absolutely amazing, transformational God we serve as a Christian who took each and every one of us, dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive in Christ, and then, just didn't, and then didn't just say, okay, you're saved, you're done. He said, oh no, I got something for you to do. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Saul of Tarsus, <laughs> he wasn't a good guy, was he? I mean, he was, he was a stinker. Isn't it amazing that God would have saved him? But not just that God would have saved him. Notice what it says here, 1 Timothy 1, 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He says, if you're going to rank sinners, I'm number one. In Philippians 3, 6, Paul described himself this way. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. In Galatians 1, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above my, many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. Think how easy it would have been to have given up on Saul of Tarsus, and to see this guy, I mean, people were afraid of him, rightfully so, because he was out to kill him, he was out to take him to jail and all these kinds of things, so naturally people were afraid of him, but how easy would it have been for people to have given up on him and said, Paul's hopeless? God says, oh no, you're not hopeless. Just like we saw on Sunday, you're not good for nothing. God says you're good for loving, and you're good for saving, and now you're good for service. Albert Barnes wrote this many, many years ago. He says, It does not follow that because a young man has gone far astray and has become even a blasphemer and a persecutor, that God has not destined him to some important and holy work in his service. How many people have been called like, like Paul and Newton and Bunyan and Augustine from a life of sin to the service of God? We should never despair of a young man who has wandered far from God. If he has risen high in attainments, if his whole aim is ambition, or if he has become an infidel, still we are not to despair of him. It is still possible that God separated that man to his service from his very birth, and that God still means to call him into his service. How many people legitimately should have given up on you and I? I mean... How many people maybe did, wrote us off, hopeless, unsavable, had our, our, our destiny already mapped out, knew exactly where it was going to go, blah, 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 but there was one or two people that loved us, cared for us, prayed for us, witnessed to us. And one day, Jesus got a hold of our heart, and he saved us, and the transformation began. Transformation began. I, I say this often, but there are different individuals here in the church that in their B.C. years, before Christ years, they'd make your hair stand on end. <laughs> Some of the things they had done and stuff like that, and what's, what is, it, it blows my mind. They will show you pictures of who they were back then. And it's like, yikes, is that really you? Yeah, they'll tell you things that they used to do. I mean, wow. But then they'll tell you when Jesus Christ saved their soul and how Jesus has been continuing to change their life 
from what they were to who they are now. Only Christ can transform a life. Convert, yeah, but we're talking to believers here. We're talking to people that already are able to worship God. So we're not talking about the transformation that takes place beyond salvation. And the fact that God, who has begun a good work in each and every one of us that know Christ as Savior, He is faithful to complete it. Is that not cause enough to worship Him? Again, when we think worship, and just like Tozer said, I think a lot of times our definition of what is worship is really entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with good Christian music, don't get me wrong. Certainly nothing wrong with good preaching, right? Okay, thank you. And there's nothing wrong with, with giving. There's nothing wrong with teaching science school. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But can not all of those things be done for an entertainment value? All of them can be done for entertainment. It is when we come to a knowledge of who God is and why we are here. Tonight, Christians, we are not here to be entertained. Our songs that we sing are to be words of praise out of our heart, not out of our lips, out of our heart, lifted before God in acknowledgement of who He is. That He is worthy. I mean, the preaching is supposed to be that which points us to who God is, not making you and I feel better and, and light and fluffy and carefree and all this kind of nonsense. It is about us coming face to face with who God is so that we might go down on our faces before Him and say, oh God, you are beyond words, wonderful. Why would you have loved me? Why would you have saved me? Why would you be transforming me? Why would you care enough to do that in my life? When you made this world, you made the, the vastness of the universe, and yet you cared about me. That's where we find out what worship is. It's not entertaining. It is pleasing to God. Tonight, the radiance of God has got to be something that we see so that we will worship Him the way we ought to worship Him. And Christian, tonight I hope that this helps to get us going and pointing us in the right direction of where that worship comes from. The children of Israel, you see the times of worship, and they were on their faces before God. They were on their faces. It humbled them so much. That's what worship does. But tonight, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you can't worship God. You can't. It's impossible. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. You have got to be born of the Spirit. You have got to be possessed of the Spirit of God. You say, well, how does that happen? That sounds weird. The Bible says the moment that you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior that the Holy Spirit of God comes in and dwells you. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not a child of God. We are regenerated, the Bible says, by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit does a work in your life so that if you know Christ as Savior, then you can worship Him. But if you don't, it's impossible to worship Him. The thing that you need to be considering tonight is the condition of your soul and the fact that Jesus Christ does love you and that Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins. He shed His blood in perfect payment, and the fact that tonight uh, He has risen from the grave, and He alone has the power to take you dead in trespasses and sins and make you alive. But because Jesus has done all of that, it is still something that you are told you must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. He is not going to force Himself on you. You say, oh yeah, I believe that. I've always believed that. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. Oh, as long as you can remember, maybe you've never heard anything else, but that does not mean that you've always believed it. It has not always been saving faith. It could just be a, almost like a church creed. Some churches follow creeds, and they'll stand and repeat a creed week after week after week, and it's just words. 
Do you really know Christ as Savior? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight. If you're here this evening and you don't know Jesus as Savior, would you pray something like this? But it, it's because the Lord is dealing with you, not because I'm telling you to pray something like this. It's not my words. It has to be an expression of your heart. But if you can honestly say to the Lord tonight, Dear God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me. I deserve hell. But Lord, I believe you love me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave. And Lord, I believe there is only one plan of salvation. It's your plan of salvation. And tonight, I repent and I believe that gospel message. I call upon you, Lord, save me. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save my soul. Has that been your prayer tonight? You've meant that. If it has, you say, I've never prayed anything like that tonight, but I did tonight in a minute. Would you just slip your hand up this evening? And our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder, the beauty of creation. Lord, this is a, a wonderful time of the year to be able to, to watch the harvest, to see the sunsets of the night, to see the leaves on the trees changing. So many things, Lord, that cause us to be in awe and wonder of what you've done. And then, Lord, to see the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ in constant change that you make in us as you draw us closer to yourself. Lord, we praise you for that. You, Lord, Lord deserve our worship. And may we leave here tonight worshiping you. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.